Welcome, everyone, to DEI After Five, the show that focuses on topics across diversity, equity, and inclusion with some of the brightest minds in the industry. Here's your hostess, inclusive culture curator and coach, Sasha Thompson. Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of DEI After Five. Okay, so this is a continuation, right? We know that what we have known for the past few years as DEI is going to shift and morph in people are getting rid of it, people are expanding it, all types of things are happening right now. Um, But there is this opportunity for us to really evaluate what has been happening and what needs to happen. And so today my guest is Amory Johnson, who is the founder of Inclusion Wins. And we're going to discuss, you know, what really needs to happen to make this work sustainable um, or to even have a stronger foundation than it's had the last couple of years. Because I think, you know, again, this work is not going to end. It is going to evolve. And so and in that evolution, how are we making sure that what we do is sustainable? So Amory, welcome to the show of this week. It's great to be here, Sasha. It's a delight, in fact. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So for those that may not know who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself and Inclusion Wins. Sure. Uh, I've been in this space for about 25 years. The, my work has been it came out of my public health career. So I've looked at diversity, equity, and inclusion as a space where we're trying to prevent some of the things that haven't worked in organizational life um, when it comes to similarities and differences and um, to to make it systemic, to to put DEI into your organizational systems and structures uh, and build the capabilities to maintain and sustain it over time so that you can morph and shift your work according to the needs of the organization at any particular time and in any particular circumstance. So I build inclusion wins after a decade inside, um, working for a big pharmaceutical company. And when I came out and moved to Switzerland, I I relaunched the brand inclusion wins with that in mind, in, in addition to some of the things that I've put around it that I'll share a little bit later. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I love the fact that you come from an industry that's not typically thought about when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Because there's this misnomer that, you know, it's, it's an HR thing. Yeah. Um, when in reality, it is every single industry touches diversity, equity, and inclusion in some way. So I appreciate that, you know, you have that background. So, you know, one of the things that I really admire and just following your work Um, on social media has been this way that you talk about systems. You talk about um, creating these almost pillars that people need to hold on to so that if the winds blow, right, or things shift, they know, okay, these are not just our values, but these are the things that are sustaining us during this time. So can you talk to us a little bit more about what that looks like for organizations, because I think for many, it's still very abstract. Sure. I I think we talk about systems in the abstraction because it really sounds good and there's systemic things that one needs to address. The way I think about systems is, is in a few ways. Obviously, it's the thinking about all the complexity of organizational life and how there, there's always trade-offs when you decide to do one thing, there's going to be trade-offs for another. So if you're not keeping those things in mind, you might do something and then be in a way surprised about the response rather than maybe even anticipating the response that might come and saying, what can I do to create the right conditions for us to do something that really makes the impact that we want to have happen? So for me, um, it's about systems over symptoms, because oftentimes we're reacting to whatever symptoms in front of us right now. It's not unusual, but because I'm into prevention more than treatment, I'm usually looking at the system upstream versus the symptom when it occurs, because it's almost inevitable. I'm interested in context over content, 
because obviously content changes and we're, we're learning more all the time and some things just won't work in a particular context. So what do you do differently? Um, and then it's really, for me, it's about uh, mirror holding. I think as practitioners, we have to be discerning. We have to see the mirror ourselves to see if what we're creating with those that we are tasked to help uh, in their transformation are getting what they need to build the capabilities when we're not there. And also that we're putting in the right work and saying, you know what, I might be going in a direction that's not creating those conditions. How can I pivot? And what's my toolkit um, and skills so that I can do that? And, and that's a, you know, context over content, systems over symptoms and mirror holding, not just out to them, but to we, um, where I'm looking at me first and then uh, engaging with everybody else so we can hold mirrors up to one another. I love <laughs> just every all of that, right? Because I think that we are so much in this check the box. Did we cover this topic? Did we cover mm. this topic? Did we cover this topic? Versus what does this look like day to day, right? How do we operationalize this? How do we figure out where there are barriers in this system or in this process that we can start to eliminate? So I think that we have this way of really looking at just checking the box on these activities versus questioning, is this a barrier that we need to have in place that is preventing us from doing more harm? Or is this a barrier that is actually hindering our folks from being able to succeed? And so it, it really is a deep dive into our systems, our policies, our processes, um, and evaluating why do we have these for the, in the first place? And what harm could they be causing? Or um, are they preventing us from doing something even greater to, to help everyone else because it's been the status quo, sure. right? Sure. You know, it, it's it's hard to do that. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so if you don't have the tools to go beyond, you know, what you've done over the past several years, um, a lot of people have been in this work relatively short term. There's no, it's actually great that that's the case. But I don't think we've always built the deeper capability that allow us to create conditions for everyone to thrive long term and to build the right networks and relationships and not just have this be an effective emotional response to whatever happens next. Um, it puts you on your heels rather than thinking forward. And it doesn't allow you to build that capability that allows you to bounce back. So. Sasha, I talk a lot about anti-fragility. It's a word coined by Nassim Talib. And I think part of the DEI work, those that are tasked or are uh, serious about making this work stick is to build the capability that you can bounce back from stressors and be stronger. And, uh, you know, obviously there are bad faith actors. So I'm not here with the Pollyannish. I'm from Kansas, but I'm I'm not in the Wizard of Oz right now land. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm really about like, what are we, what are we really creating? Who are we in conversation with? Right. And what do we miss when we don't see in a more heterodox versus orthodox way? And so I'm just, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in all of us uplifting one another and building the skills. So when the tough times come, we're ready and, and they might knock us down, but we're gonna bounce higher. Um, I'll tell a story about that later about my niece uh, who went through something pretty serious. And we talked a lot about what does it look like to bounce higher? And that's yeah. what I hope for this period of time in the DEI space, because it's a, you know, if you talk about the matrix, this is, this is another cycle of the matrix. And yeah. It, we, I've seen many cycles after almost a, a quarter of a century doing this. And so you don't get like, oh, my God, the sky is falling. You just say, hey, hey, look, we got to rethink where we are. We have to retool. We have to reskill on upskill and not just do it as practitioners, but create those conditions and help lots of people in your organization build those skills along with you.
Yeah. You know, it's called, I call it the power of the pivot, Absolutely. right? Like how do we continue to pivot in this space? Um, and it, it's so funny because as you were talking, I was just visualizing, you know, a few years ago when there was this influx of practitioners kind of in the space and I can do air quotes around practitioners and that's a whole other episode <laughs> for a whole other day. But, um, and I think part of that is exactly what you said was it was looking at the symptoms versus really checking in to see, okay, what, what's really happening here? And so it was a lot of this check the box activity or the other thing that I visualized was, you know, I used to, to be a dancer. I used to do ballet and folks would say, oh my gosh, you all make it look so easy. And I'm like, y'all aren't seeing behind the scenes where we are practicing eight, nine hours a day. And, you know, all of the things that happen behind the scenes and all of the people that are making all of the beautiful things that you're seeing work. Right. And so that's part of what I was visualizing as well, too, is people saw, oh, this looks easy not necessarily understanding the underlying root of what needs to happen, all of the buy-in that needs to take place, all of the understanding, okay, this is what needs to change here. And this is what needs to change here. Yeah. So that what you see is an inclusive workplace. Exactly. Why I appreciate us having this conversation now is this allows us to really step back and see, okay, what have we been doing on a superficial level mm. versus what are we doing to truly impact change on a systems level? Yeah. And I don't know if there are a lot of organizations that are ready to have that conversation. Um, and a few have decided to opt out by the, you know, even by them saying, oh, we're pushing, we're not doing our DEI efforts anymore right? Because they don't want systems to change, um, which I think is short-sighted. And again, a whole other conversation mm -hmm. <laughs> we can have for another day. You know, I, you know, the one thing that I think, obviously, when somebody says publicly something about their DEI efforts, we automatically go to the jugular. Oh, they're not serious. They were just performative all along. There's always another level of depth. And I'm saying that about everything. There's always another level of depth. There's always another kind of dimension of context um, that goes along with an announcement like that. And so when you're when you have a, a it's usually some very influential director that pushes this, and it doesn't mean that it's going to be done indefinitely. And it doesn't mean that DEI is gone, right? It it means that there's a, another level of possibility that we have to consider that we didn't before. So what we're working to do now is kind of look into that depth and say, maybe this company is, that's where they are, but it doesn't mean that that they're stopping DEI because you're not getting rid of, rid of similarities and differences and you, you can't stop actively engaging your employees. You can't stop creating the right conditions across all elements of your organizational design. If you do that, it's not just that you're against DEI, it's that you're against success. So you can say anti-DEI all you want, but I think some of it is a little bit of a cover for um, quite influential directors. Um, and some of these folks I know from behind the scenes, they didn't stop. They just decided to not push it as much externally but continue their efforts in a different way. And I understand the signal, but it's not all signal. Some of it's just noise to cover up any uh, potential, you know, shenanigans that are going on um, at the board level or at the executive level. Ooh, one of my favorite words, shenanigans. I love that word. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's a whole lot of it happening. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, I agree, you know, with that. I think what's interesting is how the announcements are made. Mm. To your point, you know, there are some organizations that I've seen that have not made announcements that have pulled back. Sure. Part of that is, a, again, this reevaluation of how do we want to move forward in this? I think that there are others who have said, you know, they have gotten um, pushback, right? Not even from their directors, but from certain people in media that have said, mm -hmm. you know, we will put you on blast. 
and they don't necessarily know how to deal with or yeah, counter yeah, yeah. Yeah. that, right? And so I agree. I think that there's more to it. Um, I also kind of blame the media a little bit in not doing that deeper dive into the why yeah. and understanding the greater impact, right? So I did a blog post not too long ago talking about you know these organizations that are saying they're getting rid of DEI in a time when we are in a global marketplace doesn't make sense, mm-hmm. right? Especially if you have employees that are living in countries other than home you know, headquarters. Um, and so I think that there's also some misnomers around what DEI is and all of that, that kind of plays into this. But to that end, um, you know, when you and I were speaking earlier, it was the three letters may go away, the four letters, how many other letters <laughs> you use may go away, but the actual work, the day-to-day work will continue to remain. And it may change, right? That, that pivot might be there, but you will always have difference. You will always have similarities. You will always have um, clients and customers that are in markets that you want yeah. to reach. And so the work will continue and iterate in different ways, but it may not just have those letters behind it. Exactly. I, I, I write in my book, Reconstructing Inclusion, that... Um, Inclusion is any action that creates the conditions for people to thrive and for your organization to be generative. So what do I mean by that? When you think about context, there's certain things that an organization needs at any particular time, and you need to have the capacity to discern and diagnose however you want to frame it, that, and then how do you put these things into place with people? So what's going to... uh, resonate with them so that they can move it forward. Doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. It's sometimes working through things that have a lot of complexity. But if you if you go at whatever is going on in the organization to build skills, you, you can get someplace that that you can't get to without understanding that context. I'll give a quick example. So when I was inside, I was working um, a cup of a few women from a team called preclinical safety came to me. So safety is the only thing that really matters in drug discovery before you get to market. So if you're not, if the drug's not safe, it's going nowhere. It doesn't mean, matter how efficacious it is. So they're really important and they work throughout the drug discovery and development cycle. So what that means is they, they're there in vivo, in vitro, in the, in the lab, and they're there in vivo in human. And they they know more about drug discovery than many people, but they oftentimes bring bad news. So you don't want to hear from the safety people because they might slow your project down. And so the, the, these these women came to me and they said, hey, we don't feel like we're being part of the team. And the first thing I thought is, oh, is it because they're women? And if I would have gone on that premise alone, Sasha, I would have been in trouble because I didn't, I didn't check, check with, with anybody with else. So I went to some of the men that happened to be friends, colleagues that I'd known for a while. And I said, hey, how's it going, teams? They said, well, it depends on the team. But most of the time, they're just waiting for us to drop bad news. And they don't necessarily want to hear from us otherwise. And I said, well, that's a problem because you're a part of a team. And what comes with a team is innovation and learning from each other. And you all have a lot to share. And so they said, yeah, some of them understand it, but most of them don't. I said, well, let's figure out how we can get them to understand that better. I love that example because it talks about, okay, let's get to the root cause of the issue. Um, But it also talks about, we love like operating in echo chambers, right? The folks that will just, okay, yep, 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 yep. And we hate the naysayers. Uh, you know, I'm just going to phrase it that way. But that <laughs> You're so those, nice. <laughs> yeah, we know those are the people that you need to have as part of the team. Because again, mm. as you said, that's where innovation happens. They're the ones that will ask the questions that will help you figure out, okay, if there's, this is going to be a roadblock down the road, we can address it now. Um, and so it's interesting because when I have... When I work with organizations and create these what I call culture teams or, yeah, culture teams, um, I always ask for someone that's going to be that naysayer, right? Someone that they feel is going to cause a hiccup in the process because the questions that they're going to ask 
is going to help you figure out how to answer them before somebody else asks them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so I love that example because not only does it show that dynamic and how to solve that problem, but to your point, it doesn't point to they don't like women <laughs> as the issue, right? Because we often, oh, well, they're sexist. And so that's why this isn't working. Yeah. And it stops oh. you right in your tracks and it stops them from engaging with you. And right. I think it's contact that we need. We oftentimes have created, excuse me, distancing. And what we need is contact. In any social psychology literature in history, the thing that solved really intractable problems is people coming together across differences with a common goal and time and some support from a variety of organizations and institutions to solve this so-called intractable problem. It's yeah. always been like that. But in the DEI space, we say we want to separate and call out. Okay, sometimes maybe you need to do that like a little bit, like a little bit. Right. <laughs> but you don't need to do that most of the time because it's not creating the conditions long term. And it and it and it, it, it shortens your your ability to um to make long term impact. And I, I think that's where it's all relationships. One of the board members at the company yeah. I used to work with, that's she told me that right straight up. She's like, look, Omri, it's all relationships. And if you get good at that, you, you get good at a, at a lot of things. And then you're able to actually get things done and find what works and make mistakes. But the relationship remains and people all benefit from it rather than people thinking that one group benefits versus the other. So when you mentioned that viewpoint diversity of a, of a, um, a doubter or what have you, um, I mean, it, it speaks to your work in psychological safety and intellectual honesty because you need that viewpoint or and if you don't have it, it will show up. It just you just won't hear it. It'll be talking all around you, but it'll never talk, speak and engage with you. And that's this is really what we're supposed to be doing if we want to change systems. It's not their systems won't change by us, you know, dismissing somebody. It's kind of like it's kind of like think about it why did a lot of people get into this work? Because people felt like they were dismissed. And now we might want to do it to other people because it's justified, maybe because of their phenotype. But it's an incomplete notion. It doesn't work. And we're seeing the, the response to it. Absolutely. I mean, it is quite interesting how <laughs> work around inclusion has been very exclusionary. <laughs> and it just it, it boggles my mind in some ways. However, you know, like I'm a firm believer there is the need for caucusing, right? You sometimes you just need your group to be able to figure out what are some again, core sure. issues and challenges so that when you bring everyone together, you can now address those and you're not attacking people. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, as we continue to do this work, um, I, I, I appreciate you saying, right, it is around those relationships it is around making those connections because if something goes wrong, you can now speak to what happened versus who did it. Absolutely. And we are very much in this finger pointing time frame of, well, I don't like her. And I can't even tell you why I don't like her. I just don't like her. Yeah. And that's going to impact everything that we have to do as an organization because now that's going to hinder work getting done yeah. or getting work done in an effective and efficient manner. Yeah. And so how do we, I, I say this to folks, how do we get out of our own way? Right. And just understand that other people have challenges, but we have challenges too. Yeah. And yeah. I shared with um, a group that I'm a part of my sorority, <laughs> excuse me, you know, this piece called what is it like to be on the other side of you mm. and and part of that you know it was we are so quick to point the finger at everybody else that does wrong and then when it's time for us to look at ourselves we've run out of fingers like we, we like <laughs> oh no i just I'm, I'm fine i'm great right but what is it really to be like on the other side of you and yeah, how do you i love that you and so it really causes you to think about in this work how quickly we are to blame everyone, but not necessarily what 
place or how, 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 what role are we playing in this system? Whew. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I talked about mirror holding mm -hmm. and you have to accept, and this is really difficult. So listen to this and write it down, but it's not hard to, it's not easy to digest. If you see resistance or problems in the DEI space, you need to take responsibility for at least 50% of it. And, and I, I say that because if you're tasked with creating systems where inclusion is normative and people can thrive and the organization could generate value beyond just the bottom or top lines, you, you have to know that if you're what I call um, uh, uh, serious about the impact or, or cause in the matter, like if you're cause in that matter, you have to take responsibility for it working and not working, right? And if you can't do that, you probably are in the wrong business <laughs> because, yeah. because you've, been, you've been there tasked to influence, you've been tasked to ask the right questions rather than just give answers. And we're good at answers, but we're not so good at questions all the time. And you're there to um, hold yourself accountable before you even try to hold somebody else accountable. And so for me, hold the mirror up, take responsibility for the F ups um, or the hiccups, whatever you want to call them. I know you might not like effing up. You no, might. I mean, because sometimes it is an F up. It <laughs> absolutely but, is. But, <laughs> but, but we do it and and we have to hold responsibility. If we want to be causing the matter, we have to be caused in the failure as well as the success. We can't just be like, everything is awesome and stop there. And when it hits you, just call people racist or sexist or homophobic or transphobic. It doesn't get you anywhere. It actually makes weakens your capability or ability to influence. And I think that's happened to a lot of people. Um, and since some people just decided to drop out of the game as a result. Right. Yeah. And I get it. And that's not the game that I'm playing. I'm playing the long game. Absolutely. I mean, and I think, you know, you and I spoke about this earlier. A lot of people got into this for the wrong reasons, right? Sure, like sure. capitalism was. I, no, I did too. I, I first, like, no, when I got into this in, in the in the um, early 2000s, I was like, oh, you can make money doing that. And then quickly working with Howard Ross, I was like, oh, wait a minute. There's more to this. This is deep. I got to I got to build some capabilities. I don't know what I'm doing. And I had a mentor coach that helped me get there. And yeah. I built principles and skills into my practice. And so they're the same principles and skills that I had when I, when I first got in, because that's what I was told was the foundation. And so since that was the foundation, I've carried that through. And I, I, don't, I, I, I can always do this work because there's always companies that want to work with those principles and skills. So yeah. that's, that's to me like, yeah, the money's there, you know, everybody wants to get their bag and you got to be responsible and accountable for the way you do it. And I think that's the key piece, right? The responsible piece, because there have been so many people that have kind of come into this work and haven't done the introspective work, right? Haven't looked in the mirror and have caused some harm yeah. um, and, and then dipped, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't see some of no, them. That's anymore. exactly what happened. That would happen. Right? And that and, and so now what I'm seeing is there are those that have been in this in the space, right? And I, I tell people, yes, I started the equity equation right in 2020, but I've been doing this work since I was in college. Right. I mean, when I I was a sociology major that focused on cultural diversity and ethnicity, worked in the Office of Multicultural Affairs on two different college campuses. So this is something that I have been a student of for exactly. a very long time. And it, and it um, shows. And, and that then I don't I think if people, you know, you talked about the ballet example. It, it's the it's the masochistic ways of being that you're like, I got to understand this better. And so yeah. you kept practicing and you've been doing it for all this time. It's like you're pushing yourself to be like, all right, what am I missing? Where, what angle, what, what did I miss in that conversation? It's like even right after you're engaging with somebody, like, what did I miss? It's like this constant process and you, you can tell. And I'm, I mean, I don't go around judging people, but, you know, 
game recognize game. Truth. <laughs> Truth. Yes. And, you know, and, and I want to um, also say that what you said about having that coach mentor and having um, someone help you with that foundation, I think it's so critical as well. And it's part of this every ever evolving student, right, that I am mm -hmm. or that anyone in this space should be. Yeah. Um, one of the early episodes of the podcast, I had my my she's my cousin technically but i call her aunt because she's much older than me um on who have been doing this work for 40 something years right and i'm like no she was like we won't call it a dei back then <laughs> you know it was she and she talked about the battle scars and it was having the opportunity to sit at her feet and to you know her proverbial feet because you know we were during the pandemic too so but learning from people and understanding we've been here before mm -hmm. and yep. you know, this is the power of the pivot and not being attached to these three letters and the work will continue to move forward. And do you have the skill set, as you said, right? And the competencies and capabilities to be able to continue to push forward regardless of what is happening That's it. around you. That's it. And so, you know, at this time where we are seeing all of this flux <laughs> taking place and taking shape, I am taking note of who's buckling down and moving forward mm -hmm. and who is opting out yeah. and who is um, really, you know, deciding, okay, I need to, I just need to be out of this because it is overwhelming. And it, there are moments where it is absolutely yeah. Yeah. over overwhelming. And so, um, you know, I, I just kind of want to circle back to if you have the right systems in place, if you have the right structures in place, the right foundation in place, um, when these storms <laughs> come, you will be ready and you will be prepared and you Absolutely. will know how to move forward. Absolutely. Amory, I want to um, do a little bit of a pivot. Okay. As we talked about, you know, the storms and, you know, all the change that has happened in this space. What are the things that you've been able to do to fill your cup, to make sure that you are prepared during these times for you? Yeah. I spend a considerable amount of my time every day reading <laughs> and writing. So for me, it's being able to explore ideas. Um, I read a lot of people that are like, kind of opposed to the way DEI has gone forth. In fact, I was in San Francisco last week and I hosted a talk um, with a gentleman named Jared Carroll. He's based in the Bay. Um, and we, we watched the coddling movie based on the book by Jonathan Haidt and, and Greg Lukianoff. Um, about the coddling of the American mind. And so for me, that was with people who were in the DEI space directly or indirectly. And, you know, there was a lot of pushback on the movie, which I expected. But I want to have those conversations and start opening them up because I fill my cup by checking myself. Like, am I moving in the right direction? Am I missing something? Um, what perspectives do I need to let in? And of course, I've heard a lot from people that are pro-DEI but I haven't necessarily seen people that are pro DEI come up and be in dialogue and in community with those who have this belief about what DEI is that's incomplete, but not uh, people having a willingness to engage with them without demonizing them or making them the other. And so the filling my cup really comes from the reading and the writing. And of course, I, I'm really deliberate at this age. I had a child at 48, so I'm an older dad or a gold dad or bold dad, however you want to say it. Um, um, uh, I spend a lot of time with with my kids and stepkids and my wife. That's where I charge. And of course, I try to stay in shape and go for my walks every morning. And I basically read on my walks because I always listen to some ebook, <laughs> so um, audio book. So, so that's the that's how I fill my cup. Um, you know, I talk to my mama every day too, so that that yeah, that, that gives that me gives another. Me a she mostly wants to speak to my to her grandchild, but I, she, <laughs> she gives me a little time as yeah, well. Yeah, so you'll, you'll get in there. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's <laughs> where where she, where she uh, she's usually coming from sorority meeting or something. 
Um, uh, she's an AKA. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So, so that's that's how I keep my cup filled, family, and and uh, keeping my mind engaged with the things that help me grow and be able to to serve better. Absolutely. I had to laugh at the mama part because my mom is also the one to be keeping me very humble <laughs> in this work too. So. I, you know, my mama I, was at that talk in San Francisco. She met me out there. Mm. So she was in there. She's like, I want to hear what you have to say, Amri. I'm like, oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they, they can humble you so quickly. But I but it's it's something that you know I also appreciate as well. Yeah. Amri, thank you so much for spending the time with us today and sharing your knowledge and wisdom in this space because I think. Like you said, we are in a time where we really need to reevaluate. Sure, and sure. I don't know if people know what that even looks like. And mm. so I think you've provided us with a great way to at least approach how to look at the systems and structures and policies and all of those things that we have to really see, are they set for the long haul mm. or are they just, you know, to check a box to say, yep, we did it. So thank you so much for, for spending your time with us today. It was, it was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you, Sasha. So Amory, if people wanted to get in contact with you, what is the best way for them to do that? Oh, thank you, Sasha, for asking. Um, okay. You can go to my LinkedIn page, uh, Omri Johnson, uh, A-M-R-I. I think it might be Omri. It's Omri Johnson in LinkedIn, but I'm Omri B. Johnson if you do it on the search engine. Um, you can, of course, read and order and read my book, Reconstructing Inclusion, Making DEI Accessible, Actionable, and Sustainable. Um, and uh, our website is inclusionwins.com, all one word, inclusionwins.com. You can remember it by saying, "Include when inclusion wins, everyone wins. Love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So thank you all for tuning into this week's episode of DEI After Five. I hope that you were able to walk away, as I always say, with a few nuggets. Um, please feel free to like, share and subscribe. As always, you can find us here each and every Tuesday at 5.15 p.m. Eastern. And until next time, have a good one.